Thank you for your welcome. It's an absolute delight and privilege to be here for this lecture this afternoon. Um, my name is Bishop Rachel, uh, Rachel Tweek. I am the Bishop of Gloucester, and I also have the great privilege of being the Anglican Bishop for prisons in England and Wales. Just a little added extra to my role. Um, it also does amuse me. Those of you in the Church of England will know that we have um, a vision in the Church of England called Setting God's People Free. We won't talk about that title. But I'm the Episcopal Champion for Setting God's People Free, and someone did think that rather fitted rather well with being the Bishop for Prisons. So uh, there we go. It was truly wonderful to visit Adelaide House this morning. For me, a core thing about living out my faith um, as a Christian is my commitment to transformation, the belief that reconciliation sits at the heart of the gospel. And so really wonderful to visit Adelaide House this morning to just hear some of the snippets of some of the women there, including one in an amazing rap. And whenever I listen to the stories of women in prison or rehabilitation, um, I always want to acknowledge that whilst previous chapters can't be rewritten or ripped out, new chapters can always be written. That's not only true of individuals, but also of institutions and systems who we are together. And so today I want to say something about story and changing the story going forward, the story of individuals and the story of criminal justice intervention. And I'm unashamedly going to focus on women in the context of my visit to Adelaide House this morning. And at this point, I need to categorically say that I care just as much about men in prison as I do women. And I'm hoping that's going to stop my social media feed being filled up with all the usual comments that I get when I talk about female offending, which goes something like, how about the men? So let me just say, I do care about men and women in the criminal justice system. And this is focusing on female offenders. I also want to say that there are some very specific gendered issues around female offending. And there's much that's needed within our criminal justice system um, to recognise that because our criminal justice system is developed around men. So I want to begin with some statistics. Many of you will be familiar with these. There are about 4,000 women in prison at any one time, which amounts to only four to five percent of the entire prison population. I would say that at least half of those women should not be in prison. Although please don't hear me condoning offending. Also, please don't hear me at not having care for victims. There's always a number of elephant traps when we speak about the criminal justice system. Important to say that undoubtedly there are some women who need to be locked up and who are of severe danger to the public. I'm assuming that as a given as I focus primarily on those women who don't come into that category and that is the majority of women. In 2020, between 70 to 80% of women who were in prison were in there for non-violent offences. Around 60% of those women um, have been victims of violent crime themselves. Nearly 60% of women in prison have experienced abuse. Approximately 40% of those women in prison um, on remand were not given a prison sentence. Sadly, we don't collect statistics about how many women are mothers, but the estimate is that around 17,000 children are affected by maternal imprisonment. We know that approximately 70% of women are given a sentence for less than 12 months, yet in that time they probably had uh, accommodation taken away from them. Um, if they had accommodation, their children are likely to be taken away into care. And when they come out of prison, even if they are fortunate enough to be housed, We've heard a bit about that with the Move On project. They probably won't be able to have their children back with them because the accommodation will be for a single person. 
And this in itself takes women back into that spiral of a poor sense of well-being and probably a pattern of reoffending. Incidentally, one of the problems is that we simply don't have the data so that we can properly um, assess the outcomes regarding women leaving prison. Data and numbers help us to ask the important questions. Although I also don't want to keep talking about numbers and statistics, because in prison, every woman, like every man, is given a number. But the truth is that behind every statistic and every number, there is a unique person. And as a Christian, I believe that every person is created in the image of God. Behind every number, there's a person with a name and an identity held within a story. A story shaped by the past and with the potential of good new stories to be added good new chapters to be added to that story. And we've heard some of those in those little snippets that Nancy was sharing. We can be part of that story. This isn't just about the story of other people. It's about the story of what we create together in our society. And again, fabulous uh, to see Adelaide House and thank you for that story that you are creating. So over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to refer to two stories relating to Jesus Christ's ministry on earth. One, a story involving him, and one, a story he told. And whether you're a person of faith or no faith, I hope that the stories will help illustrate something of what I want to highlight today. The story involving Jesus Christ's ministry on earth appears in a chapter than in more than one of the four Gospels. It's a story of encounter. The scene is about 2,000 years ago and it's Lake Galilee in Israel. Jesus had just crossed the lake in a boat and there's a great crowd around him, lots of people, each with a story, each with a name, but we know them only as a crowd. And in that crowd, we are told of a woman in desperate need, a woman so aware of her brokenness. It's actually all rather embarrassing. She's been suffering from a major flow of blood. We assume some sort of gynaecological problem. And in all her brokenness and pain and embarrassment, she dares to reach out to touch Jesus. And amazingly, as she touches his cloak, she feels well within herself. So many years of trying different things, so many years of desperation, seemingly only getting worse, but now radical change. She wasn't expecting Jesus to even realise that she touched his coat, certainly not to give her any one-to-one -one time, unless it was to shame her. She's been used to that for so long. So when we're told in the gospel story that Jesus stops and says, who touched me? I suspect that woman immediately felt anxious, probably experiencing, expecting to be named and shamed. And the truth is the complete opposite. And what's amazing is that Jesus felt her touch and her presence when there were hundreds of people around him. And for me, this speaks of Jesus Christ experiencing not an amorphous crowd, but individuals, unique, with a unique story and a name. And I'm often struck by that again and again when I am in prison. Hundreds of men or women lumped together with the title prisoners. Yet often in the ministry of a chaplain or in one of the many dedicated staff, it's clear that actually the crowd of prisoners consists of unique people with names and stories. The other amazing thing in that woman's encounter with Jesus Christ is her courage to reach out for help and healing, not only physically, but within her community. And again, I often think of this encounter with Jesus when I'm reflecting on women at risk of offending or women who have offended those given a prison sentence. 
The self-esteem of most women in prison is rock bottom. Self-harm is prevalent, much higher than in men's prisons. And when I visit prisons, it's not uncommon for people to ask me why I want to spend time with them. And I always say to those in prison, as I did to one of the women this morning at Adelaide House, I always say, I am no more important than you are. I've lived a different story. I've been able to respond to different choices in my life. And I long for each of those women to be able to become the person God has created them to be. And following a recent visit to women's prison, um, I received the other week a beautiful handmade card which said, your positive words filled me with joy. One thing that struck me was that you said, we are all important, we all matter. Hearing your words gave me the strength to keep going, keep doing the things I love, like knitting and crocheting. You'll be pleased to know I've just finished my first jumper today and I'm wearing it. Those women in prison who know so much about that revolving door are in a very different situation from that woman in the gospel story. Yet all their feelings of frustration and shame and despair, I think, do have some resonance with that story. That woman's own feelings amid her repeated attempts to get well. We know that many women connected with the criminal justice system have complex needs. As you heard from some of those statistics, there's frequently past trauma, abuse, poverty, addiction. Nearly 50% of women have a drug problem when they enter prison. It takes so much courage for a woman to dare to reach out and say she needs help and for that need to be met by recognition of that woman as a whole person. Her story needs to be heard and her trauma recognised. And only then is transformation possible. And that's what I've seen again this morning at Adelaide House. In 2007, the Causton Report was published so-called because the reporting on women with particular vulnerabilities in the criminal justice system was led by Baroness Jean Causton, who sits alongside me in the House of Lords. This report, going back to 2007, concluded that prison is very rarely an appropriate response to women involved with the criminal justice system. For most women, prison does not lead to rehabilitation or a reduction in offending. What the majority of women need is a holistic approach and what many of you will know is called a trauma-informed approach. Basically, this means recognising the past trauma, identifying that woman's specific needs so that there is the possibility for healing and rehabilitation. And what's needed within all that is care, and trust. I've seen how women's centres can provide that, as can approved premises such as Adelaide House. Women's centres up and down the country are places where trust and relationship is developed with consistent people, including a key worker, and in a safe, non-judgmental environment. And then women's strengths are recognised and their stories heard. And that lovely example today of that woman uh, who went to Adelaide House and had something of her gifts recognised in her artwork. Recognising the gifts, allowing for past and present trauma to be acknowledged. And then there's the opportunity to achieve positive change and increased self-esteem. A variety of issues can be worked on at once. It might be issues of addiction or anger management or parenting or self-worth, patterns of behaviour, and all of that can be held together in one place. And it's not an easy option, 
A number of women would prefer to go to prison because that feels easier than having to do all those things uh, in a women's centre. It's hard internal work and that woman's got to be at a place to do that reaching out, but it's much more effective than prison. All the evidence is that women's centres have a significant impact on reducing offending or reoffending. Not with everyone, but a much higher chance of reducing reoffending and enabling transformation to take place. And also transformation in the lives of communities. Because the shocking fact is, we are spending millions and millions of pounds on keeping women in prison, and yet there's no central funding for women's centres. It costs over £50,000 a year to keep a woman in prison. It costs about three to £5,000 a year for that woman to receive appropriate treatment, care and support in the community. If only we invested the money in the right place. And I use this stat a lot uh, with government because even if you're absolutely callous and the only thing you care about is money, what we're doing makes no financial sense at all. In June 2018, the government published something called the Female Offender Strategy. And whilst it's not perfect, it is finally moving things in the right direction, although it's painfully slow. In that female offender strategy, there is an emphasis on community-based solutions as well as early intervention, and also with a commitment to make custody as safe and effective as possible for the women who do need to be there. And of course, that takes us back to that big question about the processes, decision-making and resources to ensure that most women don't end up there in the first place. As I said, that female offender strategy was published over three years ago, and many of us keep pushing government to say, how is it being enacted? Because it is going very slowly. Given that one of the main aims of the female offender strategy is to reduce the number of women in prison, and that's very clear, the news earlier this year that the government were planning 500 new prison places for women was utterly shocking utterly shocking. It caused, quite rightly, an outcry. One of the reasons given at the time, and the prison ministers uh, do change, it feels like almost with the weather, but one of the reasons given at the time was that better policing would result in more arrests. That depressingly flew in the face of the work being done with police diversion so that women don't end up in prison in the first place but receive appropriate community intervention. Now, I do have to say there's been a lot of backtracking since that announcement of those new places and certainly conversations I've had with ministers implies that actually the 500 new prison places are about replacing unsatisfactory prison accommodation. Forgive the pun, but the jury is still out. If you want to know more, and you're the sort of person who takes pen to paper or you tap out um, you know, emails, please do write to your MP. I'd really encourage you to do that. And you can see more in information about what has already been said, about campaigns going on, if you look on the website of an excellent organisation called Women in Prison, WIP. Just Google it, Women in Prison. It's just one small thing you can do, but do so if you feel that way inclined. Um, but I do think, I do want to say that there are some changes moving in the right direction. And if we can encourage government, uh, that would be really good. And talking of small things we can do to change a story, that brings me to my second story from the Gospels. This time a story which Jesus told in talking about the Kingdom of God. It's the story of a tiny seed which grows into an enormous tree. But the thing about the tree is not its size. The thing about the tree is that it becomes a home. Its branches become a home for birds who build their nests there. 
And one of the things I love about this story is that there's no judgment or selection. The tree cannot decide which birds come and nest in its branches. It's simply a place of welcome, which provides for the birds' needs, and it's a place of belonging, which is so much more than shelter. It becomes a home for those birds. Places such as Adelaide House have grown from small seeds, funding, time, care, commitment, vision. And it may be to you that Adelaide House seems such a tiny seed in the face of such overwhelming need across the country. But don't underestimate the effect of that tiny seed which has grown to provide homes and change for women with names and stories. So let me talk now for a few minutes um, about homes. We know that too many women leave prison with nowhere to go. Stats have been quoted as high as six out of ten women leaving prison with nowhere to go. The most recent um, report of the Independent Monitoring Board uh, on women's resettlement found only 41% of women had housing to go to on release from prison. Yet we also know that if there's going to be genuine rehabilitation, there needs to be suitable accommodation with the right wraparound support. And Adelaide House could tell you lots of stories about that, I'm sure. Recently, as a commitment to that female offender strategy, the Ministry of Justice wonderfully announced £70 million in funding to support former offenders at risk of homelessness. This includes an, an accommodation scheme to house uh, prison leavers in temporary accommodation for up to 12 weeks in five out of 12 of the new probation regions and the appointment of a designated prison officer acting as brokers for that housing in um, an initial 11 prisons. It's a really good step in the right direction. It won't be enough to address the problem. In 2019, I had the privilege of being invited to chair an event on safe homes for women leaving prison. Uh, it was held at St Martin in the Fields in London, organised by the London Prisons Mission, working with a lot of different partners. And that work led to a report entitled Safe Homes for Women Leaving Prison. And that report uh, has been um, part of discussion with ministers, um, with uh, lots of local authorities. And it clearly outlines some vital recommendations for reform. And if you want to read more, you can read that report on the London Prisons Mission website. The London Prisons Mission website, Safe Homes for Women Leaving Prison. Notice the use of the word home, very different from houses. We can talk about bricks and mortar, but even that doesn't quite go the full way. Yes, women and men need bricks and mortar when they leave prison, but the issue is not simply about shelter, it's about homes. I don't know how you would define a sense of home, but I'm quite sure that between us uh, we'd come up with words such as security, feeling safe, belonging, a place where we can flourish and have dignity, a place of welcome, uh, regardless of whether people live on their own or with other people, we'd want to say that home's a place where relationships can be nurtured and experienced. People not having a roof over their heads is serious enough. But sending women back to places where they are once more at risk of abuse or places which give them bricks and mortar but no other support, none of that is going to address the issues. We need to be properly funding housing which can be overseen by specialists so that that housing becomes a home. And the Safe Homes for Women Leaving Prison report concludes that there's a need for a national strategy with adequate resources and joined up working between central and local government to ensure the provision of safe homes. As a slight aside, I would say that since I've taken on this role as Bishop for Prisons, uh, the most technical word I use most frequently is that word join up. 
If we are to ensure women leaving prison have appropriate housing which can be called a home, then as with many aspects of holistic support, there needs to be that continuous thread from sentencing onwards, perhaps even before that. One of the things we must keep pushing for is courts being provided with good pre-sentencing reports that um, engage with details about that woman's housing situation. There should be details as well about whether the uh, woman is a primary carer. We need all of that information. Again, I want to pay tribute to the work of women's centres in being advocates, often in court, for those women, ensuring that that information is shared. If a woman is given a sentence, then that report needs to be received by the prison and then supported by resources in prison so that the prison can engage with what is contained in the report. For example, if there's going to be um, a loss of tenancy or of returning to a place of abuse, then a resettlement plan needs to begin with the sentence. Although, of course, if there's a repeated short sentence, that simply scuppers all that engagement. The 2017 Homelessness Reduction Act clearly stated that when someone is at risk of homelessness on release from prison to their local authority, prisons have a duty to refer that person to their local authority. Sadly, that doesn't always appear to be the case. And even when that referral does happen, it doesn't immediately result in someone being housed. And we understand a lot of those issues, which is why we need a holistic approach. We need a holistic approach not only across courts and prisons and probation, but also with those organisations and charities which provide excellent specialist support. We need to be saying there are charities and groups who are already working at this and need to be taken seriously by courts, prisons and probation. And there are many signs that that is happening. At this point, I do want to briefly say how encouraged I am by the new structure for probation. It's probably the old, now made new structure. Um, I'm extremely grateful to Sonia Flynn, uh, the Chief Probation Officer, and those across her team who really are working hard at this joined up approach. I've also been hugely encouraged by the commitment to recognise faith and spiritual needs uh, across that team. The potential to more effectively continue beyond the gate uh, work, that work that already happens in prisons with our superb chaplains, to continue that across approved premises and in the wider community. Work has also begun with connecting the probation lead in each of those 12 probation regions with an Anglican bishop, with the hope that the bishop might also be a conduit for stronger links with uh, leaders and places of faith other than Christian as well. Here in the Northwest Probation Region, I can let you know that uh, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, Bishop Jill Duff, Bishop of Lancaster, has just taken on that role to be the link bishop for the Northwest Probation Region. It's also important that, as well as homes, women and men released from prison are enabled to make new relationships and engage in purposeful activity. We know that people coming out of prison need a home and they need purposeful activity. And again, a number of you will be very aware of training and employment opportunities provided by a wide range of business and charities. Uh, just this morning, I was on a very inspiring call with Clinks. Many of you will have heard of Clinks and the wonderful work they do with restaurants and training people in the hospitality industry. Um, Timpsons fabulous work that Timpsons um, have done. We need more of this and um, I was delighted, perhaps some of you were part of that, to host a webinar just a couple of weeks ago uh, for cathedrals and other places of worship interested in hearing about the opportunities there might be for them to take uh, people on release from prison to engage them in either volunteer work or employment in say like cafes and shops. Um, it's fantastic to see 
see what's called the New Futures Programme, which is underway with the probation service. Again, you can Google New Futures Programme and uh, you will be able to go straight through to a little video and it might actually help you think, well, might I, in whatever my sphere of life is, be able to just find out a bit more? At this point, I do also want to mention that if there are people here, which I know there are, belonging to specific faith communities, whether Christian or a faith other than Christian, there is an opportunity to plant small seeds by signing up with the Welcome Directory. I don't know how many of you have heard of the Welcome Directory. The Welcome Directory allows you to register as a place of worship where people will be welcomed on release from prison. Um, that's often just the contact people need. So people in prison have the access to the welcome directory, perhaps with a chaplain they can look at what's available, where they're going to be um, going out to, and sometimes it's just that link they need to write that new chapter in their story. And if you register with the welcome directory, there are three easy um, online training sessions and I really, again, encourage you to look at that website of the Welcome Directory, and I'm delighted to be one of their patrons. I want to stop shortly because I want time for questions. But I do want to briefly mention um, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, very snappy title, which has just come from the Commons back to the House of Lords, and committee stage uh, starts in a couple of weeks' time. Some of you may be familiar with it, um, others of you will have heard it probably in the context of um, the proposals uh, around the right to protest. It's very important, everything that's being said uh, there and that people are campaigning for the right to protest, but I do want to say that that's about that much of the bill and the bill is about that thick. So do, um, don't let that what you hear in the media about the right to protest, uh, drown out everything else and what is a very complex bill, not least regarding proposals around sentencing. To my mind, there are some good parts in the bill, but an awful lot that really concerns me. Um, and I've said this uh, in the Lord, so I'll say it here, I think a lot of it's been driven by some Daily Mail headlines. Rather than looking at the evidence and data around effective intervention. Um, actually, the idea that we're just going to give people longer and longer sentences and then everyone will feel much safer and we'll all have much healthier communities is bunkum. That's a technical word. Um, so, uh, you know, do listen out for that bill and follow it. And again, if there are things that concern you, there again are ways that you can write to MPs um, because it will go back from the Lords to the Commons and I'm certainly going to be sponsoring about seven amendments and hopefully talking to a whole lot more. Because as Bishop for Prisons, I want to encourage a criminal justice system which is restorative, responsible, and relational. Restorative, responsible, and relational. And is effective in focusing holistically on prevention and rehabilitation as well as appropriate punishment. So as this bill reaches the Lords, I will be attempting to use my voice to try and ensure that legislation enables effective ways of preventing people entering cycles of criminality and reoffending, as well as strengthening and protecting communities. So finally, what tiny seeds can we plant? Well, I've said write to your MP. It might be about the female offender strategy, uh, the need to properly fund women's centres, I don't know the stance of your police and crime commissioner in Liverpool. I meant to ask that beforehand. Um, what's being done regarding police diversion through your police and crime uh, commissioner? There's lots of great work being done in other parts of the country. Write to your police and crime commissioner or speak to them and just ask them what's happening with pol police diversion um, in and around Liverpool. Which brings me to a very obvious point. Do be well informed. Don't just go by what you read in headlines. Again, I really recommend the work of Women in Prison and the superb work of the Prison Reform Trust. Again, go to the website of the Prison Reform Trust. They provide superb data reports that will keep you very well informed. 
If you're someone who has a business or a community project, perhaps a cafe or a shop, do find out more about the New Futures programme, because there might be something you can do uh, for people on ROTL, which is released on temporary licence. I've tried not to use acronyms. We'll have more acronyms, don't we, than, uh, than we, we uh, in every, every sphere of life. And then the welcome directory. Do sign up to the welcome directory. And I guess the last thing I'd say, if you're someone who's involved in housing, or perhaps you have a house that could be used um, for people coming out of prison, then uh, I'm sure if you speak to Nancy and others um, here, there are ways that you can be put in contact with people. We um, made available one of our houses, one of our vicarages in the diocese. We wanted to use it uh, for women coming out of prison to be reunited with their children. We we couldn't run it, but we found the Nelson Trust who run that for us. We just provide the house. But it means that women coming out of prison can be reunited with their children to write uh, the next chapter of their story. I'm probably going to pause there because otherwise you'll just begin to glaze over and it's far more interesting to have some interactions. So I will pause and Ellen, are you going to um, field questions? But well, thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop Rachel. And, uh, Thank you.